Working is supported by Delta Airlines, whose new Delta Studio provides all kinds of streaming entertainment in the sky, including movies and TV shows, all on your personal devices. Learn more at Delta.com. Delta, keep climbing. Hello and welcome to Working, a podcast about what people do all day. I'm David Plotz. What's your name and what do you do? My name is Stephen Colbert and I do comedy. And when does your work day begin? As soon as I wake up, I grab my iPad and I start reading headlines. I get a digest first thing in the morning of the video clips that they've noticed. They've been up, specifically one guy, Scott Lowry. He's been up I don't know how long because usually they're long. By 7.15 in the morning, I'm getting text versions of long montages of whatever the news story that is being ground right now in the, in the mainstream media. Also, little... Things that just caught their eye, interesting patterns they see in the way the news is being expressed. I read all that. Uh, then I read a news breakdown that I get every day. We get one at night. It starts the night before. I get a news breakdown at night, and then I get another news breakdown in the morning, anything that happened in the middle of the night or a redigestion of a story, how it got processed in the mainstream media because my show is a shadow of the news. And so I have to know what shadow it's casting right now so i can distort it in my own way the way i consume raw material to turn into our product you know we like to say this is like a distillery we plant our own corn at times because we often report on our own story but we also will harvest any field we harvest the corn which is basically just reading the news then we grind on it a little bit, which is our own take on it. What, how would we break this story down? Because we have to do the deconstruction first. My show, unlike, say, what The Daily Show does, is that my show is a false construction of the news as opposed to a pure deconstruction of the news. I embody the bullshit. I don't just point it out to you. I don't do it nearly as deeply as they do at The Daily Show because we half of our process has to be constructing it in another direction. That harvesting for me is basic things like I search Google News. What are the biggest stories? I read Reddit in the morning, which is not as useful as it used to be. I used to feel like it was more stories and less memes, photographic memes. Now it's been sort of consumed by imgur photographic memes. You can still find it. So I'll go to the news page or the politics page to find what I want there. I look at Slate. I listen to various podcasts you guys do. I'm not just blowing secondhand smoke up your ass. I really do. It's, it's a source for me. I look at the Times. I check out Drudge to see what the order of the day is, what the crimes of the day, as described by one of the voices of the right. I'll look at the Fox Nation. I'll look at Fox News. I'll look at CNN to see what absolute middle of the road over the plate news was three days ago. I'll look at the Huffington Post. I'll look at BuzzFeed. I'm constantly consuming all the time just so that when someone pitches something to me, I don't have to wait to know what they're talking about. And also, a lot of what we do here is making associations between stories or patterns. You know, It's a little schizophrenic, seeing patterns where none exist, and then applying a matrix of my character's opinion on those patterns where don't exist so that he can convince you that there is a conspiracy, there is a pattern. Then... The little break, you know, eat, exercise, whatever. And then I get into a car, get driven to work, and then I start reading all the scripts that were generated the day before or two days or three days or sometimes the week before because a lot of times there are long lead stories or stories that don't get all the flavor sucked out of them in the news cycle in a 24-hour period. And I know I can work on a script or have my writers work on a script and it's still going to be salient, still have its salt in three days and so we might spend more time grinding on what the video is grinding on if there's props involved anything that's more production heavy we try to give a few more days and so i'm often reading scripts that have existed for 36 to 48 hours on the way to work how long is that ride to work the ride to work is about an hour i try to get in the car by nine o'clock and get here at 10 I usually get in around 9.15 and get here around 10.15. At that point, I have a good idea of what the show is going to be that day because the night before, 
my work day was preambled by the work day of my executive producers and my co-executive producers and my head writer who have done digestions of the scripts that I'm reading that morning. So you, you've gotten to the office, you have your three stories that you're planned, but then you encounter your staff and what starts to happen? Well, I've already had a conversation with uh, Tom Purcell and Barry Julian, who are my exec and my co-exec, and Opus Moreski, who is my head writer, who has also got the greatest name in comedy, Opus Moreski, and named for Opus from Bloom County. And then we go into the writer's pitch meeting, which is the digestion of the real pitch meeting. Opus has had a pitch meeting with the writers upstairs, we call it, in his office, little cramped room, anywhere from 10 to 12 writers at any point, plus Opus. And he comes to me with like the six or seven stories that he thinks were best realized in the pitch. And a pitch requires not just this is a story we think is interesting and here are the jokes, but what is your character's take? What is his opinion of it? Because the show is a feeling is first. You know, since feeling is first, who pays attention to the syntax of things will never wholly kiss you. And so my character has to uh, kiss the news really hard. It's very passionate. He's not ironically detached. He's passionately attached to every story. It's important, if only because he's talking about it, and which is a lot of the freedom that we get is elevating things that are meaningless, but he cares. Therefore, they are freighted with meaning. And so Opus, basically, he, he's the band leader, and he goes, hey, or you know, here's a little song you might enjoy. Take it away, Eric Drysdale. And he points to Eric, who does a solo on what his pitch is. And he explains the story, even if we know it, just to get the ground rules out. And then he explains what the characters take on it, and then hits a few jokes. And then the whole room jumps in, hopefully, on ways to add to that idea. And then I might ask him to deconstruct a little bit more, like, okay, but what are the sources you're getting this from? Has this been pre-digested for us by Media Matters or Talking Points Media? Which is always a strike against it, not because I have anything particularly against other people, but because I want us to do the digestion. And almost always these guys have done primary source research instead because that's sort of our marching order here. Or I might ask, what do you really think? Let us drop back pre-comedically and say, well, what do we think? What is our editorial opinion of this? Are we being consistent in our expression of the character's opinion as being a satirical take on our own opinion? Because you don't want to just do a joke because it works. We can make a lot of jokes work. You want to do a joke because it will hopefully build into an argument because the show is almost always an argument, though not slavishly, hopefully. Uh, that lasts for about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, that pitch meeting. Sometimes it's my favorite part of the day, and sometimes it's really tough. At the end of the pitch meeting, which I've been – and my executive producer, Tom Purcell, I cannot underestimate the driving force he is in terms of setting what the – news and comedy agenda is for that day. We are of a like mind on almost everything, which is why he's my exec. And so he helps me make up my mind and makes it up for me many times because I go, I'm not entirely sure which one of these has more legs, this story. I'll have this little notebook, which I, I keep my notes in it, and these little things change out every so often. But this is yesterday. Uh, horse carriages. Uh, we were going to perhaps do something on the fact that de Blasio wants to get rid of the horse carriages. Two stories from Tom. Something about Lindsey Graham, I can't remember. Uh, the VA won't allow you to prescribe marijuana for PTSD in Colorado. Thruples, a story about people in Massachusetts, a lesbian trio who've decided that they're a thruple. All these are my notes. I pick, as you can see, I star some of them, I check some of them. Star means brand new. Check means it gets added to a previous script. We normally have a five teams of two because everybody writes together. Almost everybody writes together. We have nine right now, so I was able to assign four scripts yesterday and then one half script, which means it's, it's really just someone doing what we call TKs, jokes to come, the K stands for come, on a script that already exists, and my head writer jumps in on that. So I have four original scripts and, and one TK team. I leave the room while the assignment goes on because I need a breath of fresh air. And I don't really want to get a sense of what the enthusiasm is for different scripts. I want to imagine that everybody's dying to write every script. And then off they go. And then I have other business to do 
in the building. Usually, I mean, I, it's show business, so I've usually got to meet with my line producers, which is the sort of nuts and bolts of getting the show up. I have to go look at field pieces. What have I already shot or somebody else already shot outside of the studio that needs to be edited? Do I have to write letters? Do I have to respond to the network? Are there budgeting issues? Whatever it is. I might read something I enjoy for a moment. Then at one thirty, we do the read-down. I might read the script out loud or I might ask somebody else in the room to read the script out loud, especially if I've already performed it once before. It helps to hear it rather than to say it sometimes. And then we'll take notes. I mean, sometimes we'll know right away, like, well, that's in the show or that's practically producible. Or we'll say, huh, that didn't work. And we don't always have the time to deconstruct why. Sometimes we just have to drop it on the floor and go, oh, well, that's how that goes. But mostly things are somewhere from half to 75% usable. When they're half, it's really tough because you don't know whether you've got a bad girlfriend, which is what I call a script that won't kiss me back. You know, like that, God, that really seems like I could make that script love me. (laughs) But sometimes you go through three, four drafts and you go, this, oh, what more do I need to give you for you to put out for me? Like the script won't love me. And then I have to go, I have to break up with this script. But hopefully there's more. If it's over 50%, you know you can push it the rest of the way. It's just a matter of how much do you want to, how much do you want to grind. Back to the corn metaphor. We've harvested. We've ground the corn. Then the writers went and did an initial mash of it. And we've got corn mash there. And they've brought it back something that contains alcohol. And then what we've got to do is we've got to distill it. Then the rest of the day is distillation. This is another act of of discipline. Not only do you make your time deadlines, but how much can you stay focused on what that script or that joke was supposed to mean or what's the best way to express it? Have you done – have you thought about it visually? Have you thought it – sound design, props? What can I do to convey the idea of that joke? And I don't mean like idea, capital I, like let's all change the world through mime. I mean every joke's got some idea in it. Have we we conveyed it quickly economically to the audience? Because you've got a lot of them to do. I mean, there's a lot of jokes. Even if we only do 12 or 13 minutes of written material in any night show, there's, I don't know, 10 jokes a minute. I don't know like, how many jokes. There's a lot. There's a lot of jokes in this show. Maybe six. I don't know. There's a lot. I, if there's six jokes a minute, I would not be surprised. Making yourself push all the way through and not give up at a certain point and go, oh, that's good enough. Because then, as my executive producer Tom Purcell says, one hour of our day is going to suck. Let's not make it the last hour. And so you have to express your vision and demand of your writers and of yourself and of your producers your best work earlier in the day because it'll just make the end of the day easier. Then that hopefully that process is done by 3.15 or 3.30, like what that rewriting is. And that gets farmed out to different people in the building. I'm usually on two of those scripts in terms of rewrite. One of them probably proceeds to final without me, but I'm on two of them. And then the whole time, there are producers in the room. There's Adam Wager and Matt Lappin, who are segment producers and supervising producers here on the show, who are on their iPhones and on their iPads, constantly messaging people in the building, going, this is what the script's going to be. These are the prop graphic video challenges that we have. This is what we're going to need. Nope, that's changed. This is cut. That's back in. And all those messages are streaming throughout the building so that... Everybody can have ready for us at 5 o'clock when I sit down at that desk. Random backwards question. What did you wear to work? It's pretty casual. I got a pair of um, old pair of jeans, some um, middle-aged man Merrells, and my favorite shirt. It's an old beaten up plaid shirt. As you go through your day, you are not dressed as you will be dressed for your show. No, no, no. That is like putting on armor. I only wear the suit for the show. I don't have a problem with suits. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with khaki pants and blue blazers and bow ties and I'm just as bourgeois as you could imagine but I like the relaxation I like the build this building is a very relaxed one it's an old brick townhouse it's a brick townhouse that I think at one point had nuns living in it you know there's a fireplace behind you over there it's exposed beams. It's not like any other television studio I've ever worked in. It's really relaxed and, and lovely. Dogs roam around this building. If we have more than six together at a time, they form into a pack, so we have to keep them apart. It's very relaxed. 
I'm going to get so keyed up at the end of the day that I have to be as relaxed as possible the rest of the day. How is the interview subject picked and, and what's the work that's generally gone into that? Because that needs to be planned, I assume, further in advance. Right now, you and I are sitting in my office at a little conference table and my board is to the right of us meaning I have my plan the next two weeks. It's not complete because Fridays are, are when we're talking and Fridays are also the day when we finalize what the, the week's going to be. But all the guests are up there. I'm not looking at my board right now, and I could not tell you who's coming up. I know that Ellen Page is out there somewhere. I like Ellen Page, so I know she's out there someplace. But that's the only person whose name I could name right now. I put almost no thought into what I'm going to say or do with that guest until about four o'clock the day of. I have a wonderful booker, Kogzek, Emily Lazar, who did real news for many, many years. She understands what I like. When the show first started, we had meetings all the time about how do you feel about this person? How do you feel about that person? Why would you want this guest, not that guest? She'd send me a list, you know, every few weeks and I'd go, yes, no, yes, no. But it was almost turned into yes, 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 yes. Also, as I relaxed into, I can really find something interesting about almost anyone I talk to. If you're interested, I'll probably be interested. So now, really only every two months, she goes, this is what I'm thinking for the next two months. Obviously, this is subject to change. If you have a problem with anyone on this list, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to book. And almost always, I go, yay, do it. Or maybe there's one or two people I go like, I'm not sure how if my character would ever care about that person's subject. Then the day of... A couple of writers are assigned to look over the person's material. Bio, the book, the article, the movie, whatever. They come in at 4 o'clock and they sit right at this table right here. I have my 4 o'clock cup of coffee and they have essentially 20 questions for me, for that person. There's a pre-interview that Emily has done with the guest or Monica Hickey, who is Emily's assistant, producer, who's lovely, or Amy Schwartz, who also works in guest services. And... I read the pre-interview. I go, well, what did this person, how did this person represent their ideas or themselves as an idea? I read it out loud for everybody. I do Emily's part and the person's part. And then I throw that away. I usually don't take questions from that. I just want to get a sense of how the person wants to represent themselves or what they sound like. Then I read the two sheets of questions that the writers have come up with, what their ideas, ideas are. I usually pick 10 or 15 of those. Those for the show to jump ahead, come showtime, a little hand comes in the rewrite room and puts it in a slot on the wall, and I say, thank you, hand. And I take them out, and I go, oh, yes, these are the questions I chose, but I don't look at them. I don't look at them till right before I go over, and then I read them over once again in front of my producers to get a sense of, like, oh, this is how my character feels about this person. Then I try to forget them. They're in front of me. The cards are in front of me, these two blue cards that have the questions but I try not to look at them at all and pretty good maybe I look once a week at the cards I put my hand on them so I know I have them if something terrible happens but as long as I know what my first question is for the guest I kind of know what every other question is because I really want to react to what their reaction to my first question is I usually end up of the 15 I use four of them or something like that and the rest of it is what is the person just saying to me which makes that When that goes well, the most enjoyable part of the show for me, because I started off as an improviser. I'm not a stand-up. I didn't start off as a writer. I learned to write through improvisation. And so that's the part of the show that can most surprise me. The written part of the show, I know I can get wrong. You can't really get the interview wrong. The Working Podcast is brought to you by Delta Airlines, whose new Delta Studio provides more streaming entertainment in the sky. Additionally, Delta's long-haul fleet not only has more flatbed seats, but more flatbed seats available with direct aisle access. Learn more at Delta.com. Delta, keep climbing. And now back to my interview. Once the script is final, we want to be about at least two minutes long because at least that much of it isn't going to work. We can be as much as six. You know, It's not crazy to be six minutes long. It's hard to rewrite, but it's not unusual to be that long. Then I rehearse it, and then we go back to our our room, rewrite a half-hour show in 45 minutes to an hour, which is super high pressure. And then when I go do the show, I am almost always doing what's written in the prompter because I am expressing an argument. 
it has a logical order, even if it seems crazy. But to us, it has a logical order in the, which, in the order in which he would say these things. And so I can't stray too much. The less argumentative it is, the more I am able to stray. Usually something at the top of the show, just for a few seconds, isn't in the prompter. If a particular moment goes well, if there's a roll from the audience, if I manage to catch the wave of their enjoyment, I might vamp a little bit on the back end, do a little filigree on the back end of each of those laugh moments. Other than that, I'm pretty much locked into that script. Because you come out of improv, how do you resist the temptation to improv it? For me, improvisation is about working with a partner. That is much easier to do in the interview because you have, you have a sounding board. The stuff at the desk is so presentational. And while we do have a partnership with the audience in terms of they play our games with this, whether it's running for president or going to the Olympics or raising money for this or, or the super PAC or you know naming a bridge in Hungary or the green screen challenge, several of those that we've done, that's fun to do with them. But those are larger improvisations that we make initiations through our scripted material and then they respond in the real world. In that moment of talking into the camera, the audience is laid back. They're in pure receiving mode. And so I don't really have a scene partner at that moment. Their part of the scene is to adore and accept my opinion. And my job is to pump it at them as quickly as I can. And so straying off of that in improvising would be so much harder than improvising with a, a scene partner in a interview. And I know how hard it was for us to construct the argument. Any improvisation I have, while momentarily gratifying, will be damaging to the overall scene that I'm trying to do. Is that an effort to occupy the character? Getting into the character for the show is a long process of fits and starts because I'm not in character all day. I'm a writer and I'm a producer all day. We occasionally improvise him for each other so we can try to find the voice. You'll often walk by people writing in their rooms and you'll see them kind of mouthing to themselves and kind of doing the character to get his rhythm. It really helps. It really helps to find his cadence when you're trying to make his argument or his umbrage. But after we do the guest questions which is the first part where I start to get into character because I've sort of improvised with my writers in that moment and my producers around the table as to what my reaction might be to this person's ideas or what they represent. They leave and I shave is the next thing I do. And then Antonia Xerez, who is my stylist, my wardrobe mistress, who I've known since, God, I don't know, 95, 93, 94, something like we've known each other forever. She comes in with my suit, and I go, oh, that's nice. Like, she's picked out one for me. Everything I wear is by Brooks Brothers. We chose Brooks Brothers year when they first started because they made their suits in America. And they're like the American and the conservative suit maker. And it's been a wonderful relationship. And she comes in, and there's a fresh tie, and there's fresh socks and freshly polished shoes. And it's very crisp, and that's very important to me, that he looked crisp. <clears throat> that's sort of the Anderson Cooper part of me is I want to really look just shiny as a bright new dime when I go out there and look like the man you know I really I really am I really am so close to being the man in my own life that I want to embrace that as much as I can that's sort of the most subversive aspect of me is how close I am to being this character that makes me particularly subversive so I put get on the suit and slap myself a couple times, drink my coffee, and I usually am watching a little bit of the news. And I'll, I'll go between usually the most polarizing news. I'll flip between MSNBC and Fox News to see how they're talking about the individual story of the day to get a sense of what the rhythm of the argument is. And because I'm, we're usually talking about it too. And then I go downstairs, get into makeup, and that helps sort of see myself go into the helmet hair. Because left to my own devices, my hair just becomes a parody of itself. You know, it's short right now, but eventually it just kind of grows out like I get this Irish fro. Then once I get out of the chair, I'm sort of half in character. And you got to walk into the room and you're in control. What's going on? What's the time? And running the show, the urgency of starting the show is very much like doing the character because the character's got to run the show too. And so I'm halfway there by just having to be in the 
the sleigh driver position, not slave, sleigh for the for the record. And then just doing the script expressed with the rhythm of graphics and video and a response from the audience, I'm 75, 80% of the way there. And then I have to drop it because we have to go rewrite it. You end up stripping it all away, and that becomes really minute work. It's like you're taking the, sometimes you're taking the scripts apart and laying them out like parts on a lawn and going, okay, okay, why is that working and that not working? How, what can we throw away and the engine will still start? Or what haven't we added? If that takes too long, if that takes the entirety of the hour I've got before I've got to walk back out again, then it's very difficult for me to be in character. And that's when I, I fuck up the most in the show is because I haven't been able to make that turn from writer-producer back to performer because they're different things. They're really different skills. But if I have 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I can stand up around the room and it's tough on my producers because they're – they're proofreading the script to make sure that there's nothing wrong in it because there's a lot of things that have to happen right in terms of the, the way we've expressed it and the timing with the graphics and the video and everything. And I'm, I'll be just bullshitting and, and laughing and joking with them, getting into that performance mode. And they're like, ah, that's, that's great. We've got we to do the script. But if I have that 10 or 15 minutes, then I'm completely there when I walk out. And the last thing is that I actually talk to the audience for a few minutes before I go out. I walk out of my room, the rewrite room, which is blood. The walls are blood red, which that's just from all the blood we've spilled. It gets tense in there. Knock on the door from my stage manager, Mark McKenna. I go to the bathroom one last time. I wash my hands. I ring a bell. We have a little bell in the bathroom, which I like ringing. For complicated reasons, it's like a, ho- a hotel bell. Ding! I go there. I go. All right. Have a good show. Or see you. See you guys. My producer Barry Julian every night says, "Squeeze out some sunshine." I close the door. Last looks. Touch my face. Uh, my face gets touched up by makeup. I get rolled off by wardrobe, uh, Antonia, and then I usually say hello to the guest. I tell them, or I've done this before. It's done at some point. I say hi. Have you ever seen the show? Sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't. I always say the same thing. I do the show in character. He's an idiot. He's willfully ignorant of what you know and care about. Please honestly disabuse me of my ignorance and we'll have a great time. Thanks for coming. I go out. I touch everyone who works for me at the backstage and I just touch it or I normally high five. I just have to touch their hands. Then I touch the prompter operator, Michelle's hand last because we're going to have a little dance with each other for the next hour. I touch her hand. Then I go behind and wait for myself to be introduced by uh, my warm-up guy. I listen to see what the audience is like. How bright do they sound from a distance? And then I have a box of chewy pens, big pens that have chewy tips on them. They don't make them anymore, so we bought all the ones we could. Like people on vacations would buy them in stationery stores and send them to me. I chew the tip of one. I put it back in, in the box. I slap my face twice. I do a double take. I chew something on the wall that I decided I didn't know was there. I look at it and look at it again. I'll often rem- think if it's a friend I haven't seen in a long time, so it makes me happy. And then I hear my name and I run out. I grab the mic, I run around, I throw it up in the air, watch it flip three or four times, catch it, and I welcome everybody to the show. And then I answer questions for about five to ten minutes. By that point, the control room is completely ready. And then uh, I'll say, you all ready to do the show? And they say, yes, all mass. And then I... I go, all right. I throw the mic to my stage manager. I get on the podium and and sit behind the desk. And then last looks. I have my face touched up again. Mic gets adjusted on my tie by sound. And then it's just me and my makeup artist are there. She does last look at my face. My hair is so helmety. She does last touches on my hair. And as she touches down my hair, I'll brush down the back of her head as if we're about to kiss or something like that. And if the audience is paying attention they'll laugh. If they don't laugh at that moment, I know that I have to work a little harder at the top of the show to get them to pay attention to me. But that's my test. And then, and then we do the show. In the show itself, are you talking to the audience? Are you interacting with the audience? Are you looking at the audience even? I think that our show has a certain intimacy with our audience. And that intimacy is through the lens and the live audience is a witness to that. 
the audience at home is actually the object of my efforts because that's my model. Real late night, or what you would think of as the classic late night, I think is the opposite. It's a relationship with the live audience, and the people at home are witnessing that because my model is punditry, and punditry is like it's a one-to-one relationship. You're talking to one person in a way drunk at a bar. I'm the drunk idiot at the bar next to you going, I'll tell you what Obama's problem is. And then the audience who's live is witnessing that behavior. And, and they get to participate, too. I mean, they're, they're proxy for the people at home. When you're doing the show, I'm, I want to get a sense of how conscious you are of performing it. Is it a thoughtful process, or are you, is it more like an athlete where you're, you have muscle memory, you have the wisdom of having done it a thousand times, and you just do it? Is it an intellectual process or a physical process? Writing and producing the show is an intellectual process. Performing the show is far more athletic and intuitive because you don't get to do it twice. It helps if you've done whatever the old saw is, 10,000 hours of it. You know, Because I've done 10,000 hours of comedy, I have this database in my mind of what works and what doesn't work. And you try to access that to know the required rhythm for any individual moment, but not consciously. As you come up to that particular shot, you try to step through and hit the joke or the moment cleanly or softly or poorly on purpose, whatever. But that can't be an intellectual moment because you can't, you can't swallow and think about your tongue. It's much more autonomic than that, you know. If you think about your tongue, you've got a giant piece of meat in your mouth, and that's a terrible feeling. Same thing. I can't think about the show. If I don't make the turn from producer, writer to performer, I'm thinking about the show while I do it, and I, I misread, my rhythm's wrong. I, I'm not aware of what the response is in the room. I never have those moments of play. And I can't make the show any better than it is. Whereas if I'm fully a performer... That person who shows up to perform can actually elevate the material beyond what we were able to do while we were writing today because not only am I conveying the words and the timing required for graphics and video, which are part of the assist of the joke, I am able to convey to the audience, live and at home, the fun we had creating it. As I've said to my my people here, I said, you know, we've already done the show for each other. It's my privilege and responsibility to translate to the audience, to convey, to communicate to the people who are watching it now what that was like through the keyhole of the character. So it has to be automatic. It has to be like dancing. After the show, do you have rituals or, or things that you have to do once you've finished? I thank the audience by answering one more question. I thank everybody backstage. who the, Some of the staff will be there. I, I shake everybody's hand. Except one guy. It's a tradition that I don't. I just wave at him. He waves back at me. And then I thank the guest for coming. And I go and we do a postmortem. And it's usually nuts and bolts first. Like, how long did we go? Is there anything we have to fix? What's tomorrow? And then my executive producer or my co-executive producer will say, well, this is what we've got. And then we'll say, what happened with the scripts today? What happened with X, Y, or Z script that we had our hopes on? They go, oh, that worked, or that one didn't work out, or I haven't read that yet, whatever it is. And then I take my makeup off with, you know, as quickly as I can, go upstairs, get changed. Someone watches the entire show to make sure that with, like, twice in 1,400 shows there was a jump cut or something like that. Like we forgot or like a graphic didn't go up that was supposed to be there. And so as a result, and it's been, I don't know, five years now, Someone watches the entire show. And I think two people do, like executive producer or co-exec will watch the entire show, and then the, the control room will watch it as it feeds to make sure that there's nothing missing. We wear braces with our belt on that one. If there's an editor to do in the guest, I usually am involved in that. All of us at this point have edited so many times that we watch the interview at double speed. We say zip squeal because it just goes, turns into a squeal, but we remember what got said. And then sometimes we have to watch the entire six, seven-minute interview or eight because we're cutting for time at double speed. So it takes four minutes. And then we won't stop it at all. And we'll go, okay. And then you'll name the pieces that can come out because you just needed to get the map in your head. 
and then you cut out certain sections of it. That sometimes is a nickel and dime thing, five seconds here, ten seconds there. Sometimes it's like, lift that entire thing about brick production in Indonesia. Who cares? And then we get the show to time. In the postmortem, are you judging the show? Do you sit and say, that was a great show for you? Sure. We all said, oh, like last night, we had a really special show. It was very odd. In the postmortem, we also will indulge in how did we feel about that show. Not always. We've done so many that, you know, the average, our average enjoyment of the show or our average pride of the show is still greater than our average frustration with the show. And so we're like, ah, oh, that's nice. You know, and, and because there's it's such a marathon, you can't like hang your hat on how tonight went unless it was really special or if it really blew. And usually it doesn't mean that like it was the audience or the material wasn't good. Though, I mean, obviously we have our ups and down days. It usually has to do with was there difficulty in today's production? Was it a wrench to the head to get the show up? Because we used to have this standard of a show was either yay, solid, like yay, solid, or wrench to the head. And we would predict at the beginning of the year how many of each would we have because we do 160 shows a year. How many of each would we have? And ha- thankfully, we always had more yays than we predicted, and we always had fewer wrenches to the head than we predicted. We haven't done that in many years. But that's what we used to say after every show, and someone would keep track of it. There literally was a running board. Now it's only if it's a particularly special show or if there's something we feel like, okay, that was a process problem we've got to fix. I don't want that to ever happen again. But that's pretty rare. How often do you watch the show? I watch the show if there was a problem, first of all, if we had to make massive fixes and I wasn't the one to do the final watch. I want to see – and almost never at night. I might do it the next morning when I'm having a cup of coffee to make sure that it worked out. You know, I'm still like a mother hen. Like, did uh, we did we fool them? <laughs> or if it was special. I didn't watch last night because I was so damn tired. But I, last night would have been a show that I would have watched because it was so unusual. And I wanted to make sure I remembered it. The feeling in the room translated across TV. But I watched it this morning, and it did. I was really happy with it. But almost 10% of the time do I watch the show now. I've just seen the material too much by the time it makes it to air. You know what I will do sometimes is I'll, I will go to bed again. I'll, the last thing I do, if you ask me when does my work day start, it starts when I go to bed the night before. Because if I'm alert enough, I will read scripts that night. And I'll read them again going to work on the next day. I'll read tomorrow's scripts. I'll read that night's news breakdown. I'll read news headlines from around the web. And then I'll go to Twitter. Then I'll put on something to listen to and go to bed because I have to turn off my head stay so I idle so high when I get home at night that I usually listen to something to go to bed because it it beats drinking thanks for listening to this episode of working on the next show I'll talk to Mary Kalbrenner an inner city family practice doctor here in Washington D.C.